long, comprehensive intro to privacy tools, or as the schedule says, practical tools to safeguard digital privacy. Guess what? It's the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what you can do to protect your patrons in and out of the library. Um, presenting this workshop is Alison McCrina, who hopefully won't need any introduction if you attended the first keynote, but in case you weren't there, um, Alison's a, a, a privacy activist, um, founder and director of the Library Freedom Project, project and a hype woman for the Tor Project uh, as well. She's sure. just mm -hmm. all around general mm -hmm. uh, privacy and library badass, yeah, I guess. That'll be the last time I've ever used the word. It's, it's been used too much. Um, what you call it? Yeah, so rather than me rambling up here, uh, I'll pass you over to Allison and get this workshop going. Thanks, Tom. I'm a hype woman for hire, actually. So like parties, bar mitzvahs, whatever you need. I got you. I'll also teach your grandma to a browser there. Cool. OK, we're going to talk about some privacy tools today. We only have an hour, right? We have an hour, even though we started late. OK, because I'm going for it. Um, there's only so much that we can cover in an hour. The landscape of privacy tools is a varied and beautiful thing filled with flora and fauna, the likes of which you've never seen before. Um, we're, like I said, only going to get to some things. Um, privacy is a lot like health, where you got to, it's something that you have to do for the rest of your life. You can choose to ignore it, and that's like a way of dealing with it as well, but like there are, you know, you, it's, not, it's not like you install these things and suddenly everything in your life is totally private and all of your digital tools are fixed. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. But also, just like with your health, the second that you take some steps to protect your privacy, you will be doing a, an immeasurable amount of good for yourself, especially because probably most of you aren't doing anything right now, which is not a criticism. It's just sort of how the world is. So first things first, please write down my contact info or take a picture of it. Um, what you see before you. First is my personal Twitter handle, at FlexLibris. The next one is at Library Freedom. That is the Library Freedom Project Twitter, mostly of like upcoming events and things like of that nature. Um, the first one is just me talking shit. Um, then that is my email, allison at libraryfreedomproject.org. Please send all, you know, all of your questions and any, anything that doesn't work out after this, if you get stuck, if you're having trouble downloading something, I would love to help you troubleshoot it. And then the last link there, all the tools that I'm going to talk about today are at that link, so you can just download them directly from there. You don't have to go and search for them later um, after I do this talk. That link also has a whole bunch of other privacy tools that I'm not going to get to. Feel free to explore them. And if you explore them, feel free to email me and ask me questions about them. I'm friendly. Um, I'll give everybody a quick second to get that, <clears throat> and then we will move right along. He's still someone taking a picture, so I'll wait. Cool. Okay. So let's cover a little bit about why any of this matters and what some of the problems are first. Um, I talked about some of these things in my keynote, um, but let's get a little bit more in depth of, of precisely what they mean for folks. So there are a number of privacy problems um, on the internet. What I like to say is that the internet is a very hostile place. It was never designed with privacy or security in mind. Um, these are related, overlapping, but not identical magisteria. Um, so when the internet was created, it was, it was, I think people who are working on it didn't think of it as something that would ever scale and really couldn't have predicted the problems of having a communication tool um, that had no built-in protections for keeping correspondence confidential. Um, so that is extended across the web to various different protocols. And it's what makes very easy certain things like massive, overbroad, illegal government surveillance. So that is obviously like a really big problem, right? I mean, we know what the issues are, thanks to Snowden. Um, in addition, we know a lot about the corporate data collection model that all the services that you use, that you rely on, are predicated on collecting as much information about you as possible. Um, the problem with both of these first two issues, the government model and the corporate one, is that because they are, um, because the governments are trying to make it possible that everyone can be surveilled, they quite often want to weaken software standards to make that more possible for them. So this happens quite often in the US right now. Our, the FBI director, James Comey, has been for the last two years trying to get Congress to, um, to pass a law requiring American software companies to add backdoors to their software. Um, a backdoor is just a hole. If you put a hole in software, anyone can scurry their way through. It doesn't have to be an FBI agent. It can be a hacker. Um, 
So they're actively trying to weaken security standards to make it easier for them to spy on everyone. Um, the corporate model um, is also a, a, a sort of handmaiden of this because um, any information that is kept can be exploited. We know this as librarians, right? If it's kept, it can be requested by law enforcement with, it, with some kind of information request, a warrant or a subpoena or whatever. Um, but the other side of it is that it can be hacked. If you keep information for long enough, at some point, someone might be able to get to it. Um, so both of those models, the, the security weakening model of the government and the data collection one of the corporations, makes it a lot easier for hackers because it gives them two opportunities um, for exploitation. Um, so those hackers too, I think it's a very important thing to realize that we're not talking about like just like some 14 year old kid in her basement. I mean, we are talking about, there is her, but really it's a multi-billion dollar industry, um, mostly run by like various mafias all over the world. So like the Russian mafia is very involved in like the, you know, fraud and criminal hacking and identity theft and all this sort of stuff. Um, and it's pretty massive. I mean, you can buy identities online for like, you know, probably five euro. If your credit score is really, really good, you might be like 20 euro. Um, so, you know, we're talking about like a, a cheap and very lucrative industry and we know people, everyone in this room probably knows someone who's been a victim of some kind of fraud like that. Um, the other part is internet trolls. Um, this is a sort of more minor um, but no less frightening uh, phenomenon that this happens quite often to, um, for example, women who make the mistake of being outspoken on the internet um, will be trolled by um, usually groups of anonymous men who then try to collect personal information about her and post it in a public place. It's called doxing. Um, doxing is very frightening because then once your dox is up on the internet, um, people can know where your address is, they can know where your parents live. They do this thing in the US um, if you get doxed someone then might SWAT you, which is send the SWAT team, which is like the American militarized police to your house. Um, and then they bang on your door and like, you know, knock it down and do the whole thing. Yes, this is a real thing that happens. Everyone's looking at me quizzically. This is a real thing that happens. Um, someone will call in like a fake bomb threat or something and blame it on you. So the opportunities for exploitation are really great. Um, and but quite often though, the most common way that this happens is a more sort of mundane family level thing, surveillance by family, intimate partners, friends, school, and work. Um, you know, if I'm an LGBT student, my threat model is probably not gonna be the NSA, right? I might be outraged by them, but like they're not actually doing any real harm to my life. If I'm also Muslim, that changes. Um, but let's say I'm not, I'm, ju I'm, just a, I'm just a kid who's trying to go to high school and I'm, I have some questions about my gender and sexual identity. My parents might be in my threat model. My friends might be in my threat model. The, if my you know, if my teachers or principal find out the content of my searches, that might mean me losing my place at school or losing my, home or something worse. So um, everybody is affected by surveillance. Um, I really hate this notion that like, oh, you only care about privacy if you have something to hide. Um, I think that's a failure of the imagination. Whoever came up with that is full of shit. I mean, they're wearing clothes while they say that, right? It's like, who, you know, if you really believe that privacy doesn't matter, like put your money where your mouth is and walk around naked everywhere. Um, or give me your credit card information. Uh, a really pithy way to get at that um, stupid, um, unimaginative line is actually something that Snowden said. Everybody's got their little Snowden button on. Snowden said that saying that you don't care about your privacy because uh, you have nothing to hide is like saying you don't care about your freedom of speech because you have nothing to say. So put that in your pocket and be ready when someone's like, I don't care about this. You can lob that at them and embarrass them. Um, so, so I mentioned some of the issues with privacy. Mm. Part of the problem is that the law takes a really long time to change. We have all these bad laws that authorize this stuff, um, out of date laws. In the US, the laws that govern um, uh, data privacy are from the 80s. Uh, the particular one that I'm thinking of is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Just to give you an idea of how old this, some of this stuff is, ECPA was, was passed in 1985 when I was one. Um, when one gigabyte of data cost $90,000. Imagine, you're like, I throw that amount away. Like, it's on my phone. Like, who cares? Like, it's like crap pictures from my ex-boyfriend. Like, I don't even know who that guy is anymore. Used to be $90,000. So I mention this because 
we're talking about a, a, an environment where laws were created when the internet, when no one had any idea how, how massive this thing would scale, how cheap it would get to be to, to store information. Um, so that's the environment that we're in now. And that's true all over the world. I use the US example because that's what I know the best. But there are bad laws everywhere, bad policy, and it takes a really long time to change them. So in the meantime, the best thing that we can do is use technology that protects our privacy, protect ourselves, and then spread it to our communities um, so that in the interim, sort of while we're waiting up for all the laws to get fixed and all this, um, we can actually have meaningful privacy. So a few of the different parameters um, for the tech tools that I'm going to teach you. Um, so they don't all fit into these categories, but these are really good categories to, to use um, you know, in choosing what technology you want to trust. So the first one is free and open source software. Um, free and open source software basically just means that the source code that the software is written in, basically the architecture of the software, is shared openly. Anyone can view it, anyone can modify it, they can make changes to it, they can examine it for, let's say, an FBI backdoor. Um, they can examine it for the amount, the kind of content that it is collecting from you when you use that software. Um, it might seem like an oxymoron that transparency of code is good for privacy for people, but basically it rests on that um, uh, community effort. All these different people all over the world can view the source code, they can see if there's some issue with it. Now the opposite of it would be proprietary software where all or some of the source code is hidden from the user. Um, Google Chrome, the web browser, is an example of this. So Google Chrome is actually very good on security, but it's terrible on privacy. Um, it's secure if you are fine with all your information going to Google, effectively. Um, the only people who have access to that source code are the engineers at Google. If the US government went to Google and said, you need to backdoor this software, we would have no idea. There would be no way for us to know. The Google engineers would know, and we would maybe hope that they'd blow the whistle on that, but we would have no idea. Um, free and open source software, even if you don't know how to read the code, there are thousands of people all over the world who are working on this, um, who care a great deal about privacy, who want to make technology more secure, and they know how to read this and you can put your trust. Basically, there's always a trust relationship that you make when it comes to technology. So you're deciding whether to trust the collective or to trust like a handful of people at a corporation. And you know, that is up to you to decide what you want to do. Um, so non-proprietary. Uh, the next thing is end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end um, -end encryption means that the content of your um, let's say a text message, any piece of data, but just for the sake of argument, let's talk about texts. Um, an end-to-end -end encrypted text would mean that the device that I sent the text from encrypts the data, meaning it scrambles it into a secret code that no one can read if they don't have the secret key for it. So it encrypts it on the device that I'm sending it from. Then it encrypts it in transit, getting to the other device. Um, and actually, I, I realize that I like make this like upward motion when I'm talking about data moving, but it actually goes down. It doesn't go into space. It goes under the ocean. Most people don't know that. Um, it's an interesting sort of pattern of, of internet uh, our, um, architecture or infrastructure. It goes under giant cables under the ocean. It's a pretty cool thing. You should look it up. Um, so it goes under the ocean, and then it goes to the other person's device, and it's also encrypted on their device, end to end, right? So. End-to-end -end encryption is a strong defense for privacy and confidentiality because it means that only the intended recipient or server gets to see it. So we're going to talk about a few different encryption schemes um, with different tools. Um, the other thing is that the tool should be both secure and usable, and this is a big tension. Um, you'll see when we talk about Tor Browser that getting a private and secure web browser that is also easy for people to use is like near impossible. And it should tell you something about the way that the web has developed, that things that we've, we've gotten out of convenience um, that have made technology simpler, um, made things easy to share, easy to store things in the cloud, all that, um, are neither private nor secure because it's very hard to do both. So we'll get into some of that tension as we talk about these tools. Um, the next thing is obfuscation. End-to-end um, -end encryption is a kind of obfuscation, but there are other kinds of obfuscation, like straight up telling lies. Um, 
you know, so one of the tools I'm going to show you will lie about your IP address, essentially. It'll give you a different IP address and make it look like you're coming from some other part of the world. Um, there are other obfuscation methods, like creating more noise to signal to, like, make it seem like there's more activity happening, um, you know, on a server or from a client to a server. So that's a cool thing because it can make it seem like more is happening and sort of obscure whatever, whatever the real, like, meat and potatoes is. Um, decentralization is another important point. Most of the technology we rely on is super, super centralized. That is to say, it's on Google servers, right? They have everything. I mentioned in my talk the other day, everybody here can think of like five Google services they use. Did, when I said that, could you think of five immediately? Probably like six, you know, Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Maps, Android phones, Google Scholar. Who, what's another one I'm missing? YouTube, Google Search, Jesus. Um, do, uh, yeah, Android. Google who? Google, I don't even know what that is. Jeez, there's always a new Google thing. Google Drive is another. So, so the point, I mean, you guys can see very easily, it's like we're talking about a, a, one of the most powerful companies in the world that has access to every piece of information about you. Whether you trust Google or not, Google someday might, might turn evil if you think that they haven't already. Um, data is an asset. If Google is then bought by like, I don't know, another like friendly mom and pop shop like Lockheed Martin or something like that, um, their data, your data goes with it. And all those policies that you signed and like whatever, what do you think is how your information is being protected um, is now dependent on this new company, this new like weapons manufacturer, whoever they are. Um, and whatever you thought your relationship was to that data is now changed. Um, also, this is true if a company goes bankrupt, data is an asset, it will get sold. Um, <clears throat> so decentralization is a good thing. Using a number of different kinds of services, not relying on one in particular. Even if you're using Google, I still use Google Maps. There is no good Maps replacement yet. OpenStreetMap is just not there. Um, but that's all that Google has about me. So, um, you know, when we're going forward, sort of think about, like, making changes to your life as a slow thing. You don't have to ditch it entirely. Um, but decentralization is something to aim for. And then the last thing on here is data minimization, and that is exactly what it sounds like. If, if a thing is taking information about you, it should be making an attempt to minimize that as much as possible. So Google Search, for example, keeps your searches for at least 18 months. That's a really long time to store that information. And I say at least because things on the internet are actually forever. And even if they're like, oh, we're deleting this from this server here, they're, they still have that information about you. They've still used it to create their profile of you that then they use to sell you products. Um, so not just in the amount of information collected, but the amount of time that it's stored, it should be as minimal as possible. All right, so on to some different tools. So. If you listen to nothing else that I say today, if you leave here and make no other change to your computer life, um, let it be this one, please. It's the most important one. Most important thing you can do for your computer security or privacy is keep your software up to date. I know that you're like, I don't have any room on my iPhone. I have to delete all these pictures to do that update. I don't care. Your software updates are so important and everyone ignores them. If you look, the next time you have a software update, whether it's on your phone or it's on your desktop, whether it's at the operating system level or the application level, um, take a look at the update. It'll say like in version 9.1.2, these changes and you can expand to see quite often these are critical security vulnerabilities that are being fixed. What do you think happens when you tell a software developer that there's something wrong with the software that they're, that they're using? You report a bug to them. Well, they go in and fix it, and through a system of versioning, they'll release a new version of the software where you don't have to download and reinstall the whole thing from scratch, you can just update it, but what they're fixing is these, these big security problems. And very vulnerable software like Adobe Flash, which no one should use ever, um, has, uh, probably has an update like every week. So the problem, you know, part of the problem with, with leaving these is that if I want to exploit you, whether I'm a sovereign state or a hacker or whatever, it's so easy for me to tell that you have out-of-date software running on your machine. When you connect to a Wi-Fi network, for example, it communicates exactly that information to the network, not just the network administrator, but some, anyone observing the network traffic can see that you have uh, the old iOS 8. 
right? So that if I see that and I want to exploit you, I'm going to send you some malware that's appropriate for your out-of-date software. So if you do nothing else, keep your software up to date. I see everybody's like fumbling, like, oh my God, I have to do it right now. Um, <laughs> yes, you should feel that way. But also, no one ever told you this. I know it's totally not your fault. The thing is, there was a study of like technical people and then non-technical people, which like, pfft, but you know, people who work in technology and people who don't. And what they, they were asked, like, what's the most important thing I can do for my computer, you know, keep it secure? And all the non-technical people said, have an antivirus program. And all the technical people said, keep your software up to date. And I think that the disparity in this, in this answer is the failure of the tech people. Because antivirus software doesn't really work. Um, it's important, but not that important. But who could have possibly told us this? Why would you put that in the hands of the user? Anyway, I digress. All right, so... <clears throat> Most important thing, software updates. Now we're gonna talk about Tor Browser. Um, I mentioned Tor a bunch uh, in my talk yesterday and I'm like generally a Tor evangelist. Um, let me just say for the purposes of full disclosure, I work with them but they don't pay me. So, you know, that <laughs> should, <laughs> I'm not compromised in that way. Um, Tor Project is a, is a mostly volunteer run operation and I do a lot of outreach stuff for them in my capacity as Library Freedom Project. So Tor is, um, Tor is privacy protecting software that most people will use as Tor browser. And I've got a little screenshot of it right here. Tor stands for the onion router. Basically what Tor does is pretty much two things. And in the next sc screenshot, I'm gonna show you precisely what these are. It gives you location privacy and also what I like to call application level privacy. So as you can see from looking at this little screenshot of Tor Browser, this is the view that you get the first time you open it. Um, it's built on a version of Firefox, uh, what's called an extended support release version of Firefox. So if anybody uses Firefox, you can see it looks really similar. Um, like the menu button up in the top is the same and the just general layout of it is the same. I would say the big differences with vanilla Firefox and Tor just in the look are that um, if you use any uh, browser extensions, they are um, on Firefox, they'll show up all over on the right and your search bar is sort of moved over. In Tor, the extensions are on the left and I'm gonna get to those in a sec. Um, but that's basically the difference in the look. Now, in terms of what they actually do, they couldn't be more different. So there's nothing that you can do to Firefox or any other browser for that matter, Chrome or whatever, to make it as privacy protecting as Tor browser. You can make some changes to it, um, but Tor is out of the box the most privacy you can get in a web browser. Um, and you don't have to make any changes to it to make that happen. So here's a little bit of how Tor works with some screenshots. So the first thing, you know, I mentioned the location privacy thing. So the thing I think people know about Tor browser the most is that it obscures your real IP address. So what it does is it takes, it starts with you at your web browser. And I've got a little screenshot of this. I know it's small, um, but you guys can all see the little Tor circuit that's up there. There's two of them and I'm gonna show you the difference with each, but just look at one of them for now. Um, you can see if you're looking at the, te the one um, on the top, um, I have Twitter open, I've got my own Twitter page, and you can see I've clicked on the little um, onion button, which is what shows me this like expanded view of information here. And what I'm looking at is that it starts with me in my browser, and then it goes, it bounces to a relay in France. So this relay is a computer that someone runs um, that they've set up just to forward traffic on the Tor network. They're a volunteer somewhere in France um, or with server space in France. And so that's the first spot that my traffic um, goes to. Now, when it goes to that relay, all that relay knows is where it's going to. It doesn't know anything about where it's come from. So that relay unwraps the, the first layer of encryption and sees that it has to go on to this second relay in France, right? So then it, then it sends it on to that relay, that other relay, new IP address. And that second relay basically opens it up and sees, okay, the last relay this is going out of is in the US. So again, it doesn't know where it's come from and only knows where it's going to. So then it goes out of that last relay in the US and that's the only one that knows the last, the, the website that you're actually trying to visit. So it bounces through this network of three relays. Each one only has forward information, doesn't have back information. So it's very hard to correlate you back to your original IP address. Um, what is a use case for this that's actually meaningful? Well. Many journalists and whistleblowers and people like that need location privacy. Um, 
But on sort of a more mundane level, um, one group that I like to talk about uh, that are big Tor browser users are people who are domestic violence survivors because they are under a serious amount of threat of their physical locations being discovered. So one thing that Tor Project does is they, they actually install Tor Browser on the computers in transitional housing for domestic violence survivors because, you know, you're talking about like, it's, that's getting into a whole separate sort of thing of like how easy it is for abusers to find location, but there's a lot of malware out there that will do this. So if you're living in transitional housing and your abuser finds your location out, it's not just that they found out where you are, they found out where all those other women are too, and they can maybe publish that. Um, so it's really scary stuff. Um, another use of this is that in countries with super restrictive internet, like um, in China, there is the Great Firewall, um, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia, Ethiopia, each of them have some version of their own um, censorship or filtering for their citizens. Uh, for, for people in those countries, using Tor browser means that they can get on the regular internet. Um, because it makes it look like they're coming from a part of the world that they're not in. And a lot of that filtering happens at the IP level. Um, but for the rest of us, if that's not in your use case, that's fine. There are still great reasons to use Tor Browser. So location privacy, and then we've got application privacy. So you can see in these two different screenshots, I've got, um, on this one, I'm in uh, Twitter, and I've got Library Freedom Project in a second tab. And then this one, I'm in Library Freedom Project, and I've got Twitter in a second tab. Now, what do you notice about the circuit for each of those? This is the same browsing session. The circuit is completely different. So it's not completely different, actually. The first one is the same, but that's the guard relay stays with you for two months. That's always going to be the same. Um, so what this means is Library Freedom Project thinks that I'm one person right, thinks that I'm associated with one IP address. Twitter thinks I'm a totally different person. So this means that Twitter and Library Freedom Project will never know information about what I'm doing on each of those sites. So if you have one tab open for work, and you have one tab open for school, and you have one tab open for personal stuff, there is no way for those sites to cross-correlate anything that you're doing. This is a common form of tracking. Um, advertisers use this, A-B testers use this, analytics use this. To get a full picture of you and your browsing habits, they follow you all over the web. This is near impossible in Tor Browser because they think that you are a totally different person. So it prevents that cross-site correlation. Um, it blocks, um, uh, by default, uh, third-party cookies, um, deletes session information, deletes browsing history, um, blocks certain scripts by default. Um, it writes nothing to your local disk, so it leaves no local trace of your browsing activity. You guys have probably seen on a regular browser, it creates little temporary files like that are like hidden in some weird part of your computer, and you can occasionally go in and delete them if you know where they are. Tor Browser doesn't do anything like that. There is no memory um, of what you've done on there. Um, it's bundled with a couple of browser, browser extensions. If people in here have never used a browser extension before, a browser extension is just a component that adds a feature. Basically, it's just a little thing that you can add into your browser um, that will make it enhanced in some way. So Tor comes with a couple of privacy enhancing extensions. I'm going to get into some more in a little bit when we talk about Firefox. Um, you should not add any more extensions to Tor browser because it can compromise some of the privacy. Basically, Tor is like an out-of-the-box thing. You want to make as few changes to it as possible. Um, because Tor has all these sort of default security and privacy settings, it can be, uh, there can be some usability barriers. Um, what do you think happens in Tor if you go to Google Maps? It thinks that you're like in Sweden or something and then it gives you results in Swedish. The good news about that is that you're totally used to using like Google Maps. You're, you know the UI, right? Like you're not, you're not unfamiliar with it. Um, but for those of us who work in environments where we have a lot of people with lower technical literacy skills, this can be really challenging. Um, I like to use Tor even just to, for, for those folks, I would say even just using Tor to see how much the web is dependent on personalization and how much of the web doesn't work in Tor should give you an idea of how much of the web is dependent on tracking. So if you're like, I don't fucking know how to understand this thing, this is that nothing is working. Yes, this is, a, this is a teachable moment, right? So some usability barriers. There are some sites that block Tor. Um, there is a... Um, a service called Cloudflare, which is sort of hard to explain. Basically what Cloudflare is, is it's, it's kind of like a trusted um, 
uh, firewall. It's sort of, think of it as like the, you know, the Chinese have the great firewall. Um, we have this like private one that blocks all Tor exits. And a lot of websites use it to prevent certain kinds of malicious activity on their sites, but they're very overbroad in their, um, in the rules against this, and so they block Tor, um, or they can send you into like an infinite CAPTCHA loop hell, where you have to keep solving CAPTCHAs and you're like, I'm doubting my humanity at this point because I'm <laughs> not taking it. Um, so just be aware there can be issues like that. Um, I would recommend download Tor Browser, start using it, and if something weird happens, either switch back to vanilla Firefox or like email me and ask me about it and I can tell you why it happened. Um, Tor works on Android. It's called OrWeb. There's also a Tor proxy for Android called Orbot. Unfortunately, there is no supported iOS version right now. Um, we're working on it, but it's very hard to make things for Apple. Um, however, however, if you go to the Apple store, you will see about 10 fake Tor browsers. So the whole like, oh, Apple's uh, store is like a walled garden. They, they're so approving of everything that goes in there. Yeah, somehow they let like 10 of these fake things in, but they won't work nicely with people at Tor Project to make a real one. So just saying, Apple, screw you. Um, so that is Tor Browser. Um, so the thing is, Tor Browser is only going to take you so far, right? It's a really great starting point if you want to protect websites from knowing certain kinds of information about you. You want to protect your location information. I use Tor for probably like 90% of my web browsing. Um, but Tor only gets you so far, it doesn't actually encrypt the content of what you're doing on different sites. Let me explain. So if I'm on Tor browser and I go to like bbc.com, BBC doesn't know who I am. They don't know other sites that I'm on. They don't know uh, where I go when I leave BBC and the trackers that are on bbc.com are gonna have a harder time of following me. Um, but if I leave a comment in the comment box on one of the articles, and I somehow identify myself in that comment, that goes over out of the internet on a postcard because BBC uses HTTP and not HTTPS. So it's super important to use Tor Browser and HTTPS together whenever possible. Let's talk about HTTPS. So this is probably something that you're fairly familiar with, at least you've seen it, your banking website uses it, probably like, you know, if you have a login page for your library's website, it will use HTTPS for the login page. Basically what this means is, um, you know, you've got your hypertext transfer protocol. That's the, the, where you get all your websites. The web is made up of a bunch of different protocols and that's like kind of the biggest one. And with the S on the end, it stands for hypertext transfer protocol secure. What this means is that whoever administers that site has gone in and installed <clears throat> a security certificate on the back end of the site to encrypt the traffic that goes out between you and the server on the other end. So what does this mean? So if I'm on my library's website, actually Kev asked about this in my talk the other morning, so you guys might have heard me say this already. If I'm on my library's website and they're not using any, they're not using HTTPS, they're just using HTTP, and I look for books about abortion, or I look for resources for, you know, where I might be able to like, you know, get some drugs for that illegally, um, or semi-legally or whatever. Um, all of the information of everything I'm looking at on the site is going out over the web in plain text. So who can see that? Anybody who connects to the Wi-Fi network. Absolutely anybody who connects to the Wi-Fi network. You can get a program called a packet analyzer. There's one for free called Wireshark. You install it on your computer. And what this means is um, I connect to a Wi-Fi network. If it's a locked network, I just need the password. And then I can see all the traffic that's going out over that network. And if it's in HTTP, I can see it in plain text. I can see that somebody with this IP address looked up books about abortion. Like it, in real time, I can see it as soon as she made her search. So with HTTPS, I'm totally blinded. The only, the only time that that traffic is decrypted is the server on the other end. So this is one form of encryption. This is for websites. So it's super important that all the sites that we use use HTTPS, but this can be harder, right? It's like you don't run all the sites that you visit, um, but keep an eye out for it. You know, notice when you're, oh, notice when you're not using it. And if you see that a site doesn't begin with HTTPS, you should send an email to that site. Um, news websites are the, uh, kind of the biggest culprits. Like I mentioned BBC, but you could, I could go on all day. Every major news site, doesn't use any kind of HTTPS. Now the other thing is that if your library uses it but all they encrypt is the login page, that actually doesn't do anything. Um, it creates 
a cookie, uh, a login cookie that then goes on to the unencrypted part of the site. And not only can I still see everything that person is doing, I can now see that they're the one who's logged on and I can steal their login information. Um, so if your system administrator is like, it's fine, we encrypted the login, you should be like, Allison said that's bullshit. Um, so the thing about HTTPS is that it, implementation can be tricky. Um, there is a project called Let's Encrypt that it's one of the things that I've linked in the privacy toolkit. It's trying to make it really easy for anybody who runs a website to set up strong encryption by default and have it renew forever and ever. So if you want to do this for your library site or if you run your own, um, take a look at that link in there and see um, if it sounds like it makes sense to you. If it totally doesn't, um, we have volunteer technologists at Library Freedom Project who will help you set this up. And you don't even have to like give them your password or anything, they'll help you over the phone. So um, in the meantime though, you can encourage websites to start using it. Um, this is just a comic to like, you know, transition to the next thing um, that I think is really funny. It's like, you know, crypto nerd imagination. Like, you can actually hit him on the head with a wrench and get his password. Yeah. So, I'll let everybody like take a moment with this comic. Who reads XKCD? Anybody? Cool. Some people. XKCD has a lot of good um, nerd content and a lot related to security and privacy. So, moving right along. <clears throat> So I talked a lot about um, uh, web trackers and how Tor Browser can prevent a lot of them um, from following you by default. But if you kind of feel like Tor Browser might be a little too tricky for you, or you want an option for um, your other browsing sessions, if you use something like Firefox or Chrome, there are a few privacy extensions that you can install that will help block, tra help block trackers. Um, the one that is installed in Tor Browser is called NoScript. And what NoScript does is sort of, it blocks everything and then you have to allow stuff back in. And I don't have time to show you it in depth, unfortunately, today, unless if, if you guys want to see it, I have it on my computer and I'd be happy to show you. Um, so, but that's sort of, that's really tricky, right? It's like, it puts all the control in your hands. You have to go in and, and, and allow things back in and sometimes it can break websites. So there are two browser extensions for Firefox that operate with a blacklist, you don't have to go in and make any changes to them. So these two tracker blockers, one is called Privacy Badger, and one is called uBlock Origin. And I'm gonna show you how they each work. I've got a screenshot of Privacy Badger here. Um, but I like to use them together because sometimes one of them will catch a certain tracker that the other one won't. Um, and I think that it's just sort of good housekeeping to have them both. So I've got the New York Times website up here, and I have installed Privacy Badger in my browser and it's super easy if you go to the links in the Privacy Toolkit. Basically you click the link for Privacy Badger and you just follow the prompts and then it's just installed in your browser. Browser extensions are very easy to install. Um, so Privacy Badger, once you have it installed, this is a screenshot of Firefox, of course. We don't want to add any of these things to Tor Browser. Like I said, don't add anything new to it. This is for your backup browser. Um, over here up in the right, you can see I've got some little privacy extensions. They're just those little symbols. They're real tiny, I know, I'm sorry about that. Um, I have clicked on the Privacy Badger one and it lets me see all the domains that it has identified as doing some kind of tracking. So when you first start using Privacy Badger, it will not block anything. It's gonna start to sort of follow those different trackers and see which of them are following you. Once it gets a better idea of what's tracking you, it starts to block them. So it's a sort of smart thing. Um, the, the longer you have it installed in your browser, the more it gets to know um, your browsing patterns. Now it doesn't keep any of those, so it's not like another surveillance thing. Um, but it gets a better sense of who's, who's tracking you and how to block them. Um, so when you first open it up, you'll see that all the trackers, the little sliding bar is in green and it's allowing them access. You can go in and block them all if you want to, but you really don't have to, and I actually kind of discourage it because you might end up blocking something that is necessary for the page to function. You should let Privacy Badger do this work for you because like I said, it's gonna start to figure out what things are tracking you and then start to block them um, by default. But you can always take a look at it and see what it's blocking, um, and you can just kind of get a sense of how many different trackers exist on a site. So like, just in this little list, you can't even see, um, 
if you scroll all the way down, there are a whole bunch more in this. Um, it's got Google Tag services. It's got New Relic, which is analytics, um, different um, analytics and ads that are native to New York Times, and then probably some more advertisers and trackers that are down at the bottom. Because whenever we load one of these sites, it's like probably between five and 30 different tracking domains are loading in the background. And we never consented to this. And then they follow us not just on New York Times, but on all these other sites. So the only way around it is to totally block them. So that's Privacy Badger. Ublock Origin is a little bit more complicated. So actually, let me back up. Um, when you install Ublock Origin, it will show up up there on the top right. Um, it's a little shield. Everybody see that tiny little shield up in the top? So Privacy Badger is a cute little badger. It's made by the good people at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, so you can trust them. Um, Ublock Origin is um, a smaller project. It's free and open source software. Um, it doesn't have the cute little UI that Privacy Badger has where you can see all the tracking domains. If you want to see what, you're, what uh, is being tracked and blocked with uBlock Origin, you click on the little shield and it will give you an option to go to the log. And this is what the log looks like. And I know it's like a jumble of like websites and it's kind of confusing. Basically, I'm going to explain exactly what you're looking at. So anything that's in red or yellow um, if it's in red, uBlock Origin has identified it as, as something that's tracking you from site to site and has blocked it entirely. If it's in yellow, they've identified it as something that um, is collecting cookies from you on that site, maybe not following you elsewhere, but still collecting information about you there. And so they've blocked just the cookies. Um, and it gives you a good idea of just how many of these are, are happening in the background of all these sites that you use. Um, so even if you're like, I have no idea what I'm looking at and I will never look at this logger, you should know that uBlock Origin is just working in the background. So one of the cool things about it is that since it's blocking advertising scripts from tracking you, it's also, it also means that you won't see the ads. So that's a nice thing. It's an ad blocker. Um, this is an important thing for privacy. I think there's some tension. People think that um, it's going to ruin the publishing industry if we block all the ads. And that is true. It definitely will. They have to figure out a new model. But if they can figure out a way to serve us advertising that doesn't track us, that's the number one thing. The second thing is that that doesn't give us malware. Um, that is super important. So by you not seeing those ads, you're now also protecting yourself against malware domains, which is a huge problem in advertising where let's say I have a little ad on the side of my page. It says J crew. I think it's a real J crew ad. I click on it. Oh, it actually turns out it's a malware domain. Now I have malware on my computer. It was masquerading as a J crew ad and I had no way of knowing. And the websites are not vetting this. That is very important to know. There's no, you know, YouTube isn't like, we're not going to put anything malicious on here. They'll take anybody's money. And they get in trouble for this all the time, but since they're Google, they get a slap on the wrist and then they keep doing it. Um, so the only option we have right now, unfortunately, is to blind them. <clears throat> uh, I mentioned a lot of issues with searching and how Google uh, stores the content of your searches for at least 18 months. And this is one way that it creates a sort of personal dossier on you to follow you all over the web and sell you products. Um, <clears throat> this is true about all the major search engines. Um, oh, let me actually, quick sidebar, using Tor browser, you will still see ads, but they won't be able to track you. There are some reasons why Tor doesn't have an ad blocker built into it. It's a little complicated, but um, they're still not tracking you. So just be aware of that. Um, anyway, back to searches. So. Google, Bing, Yahoo, all the major search engines, they are collecting and storing everything you type into them. Um, there are a number of search engines that you can use that don't track you. Um, the one that I have up here is Disconnect Search. There's one called DuckDuckGo. There's another called Start Page. They all function really similarly. This one happens to be my favorite one, um, but I encourage you to take a look at some of the others if you don't like this one. So here's why I like Disconnect. Um, so first of all, the address of it is search.disconnect.me and it's on the list of privacy tools. You can get it as an extension for your browser, so it'll show up as your little default search engine. You can get it on your phone. Um, <clears throat> and what it is, is it's a search engine that uses Google's algorithm. As you can see, it has selected, like there's a little Google name up there. But basically what it does is it proxies the traffic that's going back to Google, so it hides it from Google effectively, or hides information about you. So Google knows that you're making this search with their search engine, but it doesn't know anything about you and then is not able to correlate it back to other information about you. 
So I like this because it gives me all the richness of Google's results without Google tracking. Um, and I have a little sample search here so you can kind of see if you look up Beyonce, you will get all the same Beyonce results that if you're looking in Google search. The difference is in the layout of this, you can see up at the top, it tells you what the protected tools are. Um, so if you use regular Google search, Google image search, videos, news, et cetera, they will all not communicate information back to Google about you. But if you use maps or shopping, um, or some of the other ones, it will. I like that because it makes it really easy for you, the user, to tell what's safe and what's not. Um, you will notice that this is actually like a very kind of disruptive change to make in your life because you're used to a very personalized search. If you look for a hardware store on Google, it will show you the one closest to your house. Um, Google knows a great deal of information about you, and so switching to a search engine that doesn't know um, can be weird. But again, it's nice to see how the web looks without personalization. All right, let's talk about mobile. There's my dog using a phone. She's very advanced. I like to put dog pictures in where possible. Her name is Soso. She's a chihuahua. She's crazy. Um, so, mobile stuff. Mobile phones are kind of doomed. Um, I'm sorry to tell you that. I hate to, like, be that guy, but, you know, I think it's really important to be, uh, to be honest with people and have reasonable expectations. You can have privacy on a desktop computer. It is absolutely achievable. You can't on a phone. Um, here's the problem with phones, the fundamental issue with phone architecture. So everybody's got one of them, little pocket tracking device. Um, and, and it's not, you're, you're, it's not what you think I'm going to say, which is that, yeah, the phone is pinging a cell tower all the time approximating your uh, a specific location and, you know, creating a record of everywhere you've been and all this. Yeah, there's that too, totally. But an even bigger problem is how the phones are designed. So <clears throat> your phone, um, unbeknownst to you, has actually three operating systems. So there's the SIM card. We're not going to worry about that one right now. Um, there's the application processor, which is the one that you see, which is like all the fun Angry Birds and Angry Birds Miami and, you know, Angry Birds Nintendo or whatever that you're using. Then there's a third operating system that's totally secret called the baseband, the baseband processor. And it's evil and it runs the whole show. So here's how the baseband works. Um, so the application processor is like the thing that you see, you're like using all your apps, having a great time on your phone. The baseband is the thing that controls all the radio connections of your phone, so your data network, essentially. Um, it tells the phone everything that is happening with cell towers, um, and it has absolute control over everything that's happening on the application processor. So usually the analogy that is used, I don't like this analogy because I think it's weird to, I think it sort of diminishes what this means for actual humans when you use it for machines, but I haven't come up with a better one. Um, people usually say it's a master-slave relationship, that the baseband is the master and the application processor is the slave. And it's absolutely true. The baseband tells, you, the application processor can never do anything without the baseband. So what's wrong with the baseband? Well, it is millions of lines of code from the 90s. And in the 90s, we hadn't even started thinking about privacy and security at all. Um, it is massive, so, you know, even if it were able to, if, even if someone were auditing it, which it's not getting audited, um, it's so big that trying to find problems in all those millions of lines of code is, like, near impossible. Um, and so we know that there are all these, we, these, these issues with it. Um, there are security flaws that are found in it all the time. The problem with that even is that the basement is run by all these really super secretive proprietary companies like Qualcomm that don't want people to audit their code. And this is just the world that we live in because everyone wants to have a phone. And it's like this super secret, you know, like all the mobile engineers that I know are like, no one talk about the baseband, please. Um, the other problem is that it will accept any connection that thinks that it thinks is a cell site. So um, this is how something like Stingrays operates. So if people don't know what a Stingray is, it's um, Stingray is the commercial name the real name of it, the non-commercial name, is an IMSI catcher. IMSI is a unique identifier for your mobile phone. It's sort of like a MAC address for a computer. IMSI, I forget, it's International Mobile Standard Identity or something. Um, the IMSI catcher, um, the name is misleading because it can catch a lot more than the IMSI. 
Um, basically, stingrays are, are these devices that the police have gotten. Apparently, the, there's some um, speculation about Guardi having, having them. Um, they're getting cheaper all the time. They mimic a cell tower, and the police can basically set one of these up somewhere, like at a protest or something, and then everybody's phone connects to it as if it's a real cell tower, and then they can get a ton of information that's on the phone. Now, the other problem with this is that the IMSI catchers in a, in a smaller um, Wi-Fi um, simulator kind of device that, that's much cheaper, it's like 200 bucks, um, regular people can get these that then can connect to your phone kind of in a similar way and use that to exploit you. So it's super easy for anyone to, to get at your phone. Um, and excellent, five minutes, cool. Um, oh, 10 minutes, yeah, sorry. Wait, we started late, yeah, so cool. Great, because I want to take questions, I hope. Um, uh, so yeah, so the, so basically I would say, you know, use your phone understanding that like it's very hard to have any kind of privacy. I like compartmentalizing things on my phone. I have an email address that I only use on my phone. I never, you know, I know that that's not reasonable for a lot of people. You need your work email on your phone. And if you do, you know, go for it. You should just know what the problems are with it. Where possible, you should compartmentalize and use services on your phone that you never use anywhere else. Um, and I really would recommend against doing anything um, of any sensitive nature on your phone. I mean, banking is sort of tricky, right? Because if you get, most banks, like if you get exploited, they'll like, you know, refund you or whatever. Um, but it's harder uh, to get back your identity if you've been the victim of identity theft or fraud. So think about how you're sharing personal information on your phone. Um, now there is one app that you can use that I like a lot that is, um, that can give you some uh, better measure of privacy um, with your texts and calls and is, should be resistant to IMSI catchers. Um, the other thing I want to say really quickly about phones is that um, as far as everybody, every phone is subject to the, to the evil baseband and then as far as phone security between Android and iPhone, iPhone is here and Android is somewhere in the basement. I'm really sorry, Android users. Android phones are incredibly insecure by design. Part of the problem has to do with the software update schedule. So the only Android phones that get their updates on a really regular schedule are Nexus, because they're owned by Google. Every other kind of Android phone, Samsung, Motorola, et cetera, they're not getting the operating system updates with any regularity, sometimes never. And this is like a scandal at Google. It's a crazy thing, all the people that I know at Google are like, no one wants to talk about Android. Kind of like how no one wants to talk about the baseband. And it's a crazy thing that this is what they're allowed to do to you as the consumer, but they totally are. Because they're above the law, they make all this money, and you're gonna keep buying the phone, right? So what do they need to do this for? So I, I'm sorry to the Android users to like tell you this, but it's really, your, your phone is especially bad. Um, but you should know. So that said, okay, here's the thing you can do. So Signal is an app that you can use to make encrypted texts and calls. It works on Android, it works on iPhone, it works to send a message to your Android friend from your iPhone. It's great, it's cross-platform. The only thing is that both people have to have it installed. And it's as easy as just getting it out of your app store. So basically, here's who can see your text if you're not using something like Signal. If you use Android to Android, it's a postcard. Anyone can see it, it goes out over the web in plain text. Um, Android iPhone, also a postcard. SMS, not safe. iPhone to iPhone is encrypted in iMessage. Um, Apple says they don't have the private keys, but we have to take them at their word, right? Because they're a private company. We don't, they're proprietary, we don't know. I think they're probably telling the truth about that, um, but you're still putting a lot of trust in Apple there. Signal is free and open source software. They do not have a copy of your private keys. The source code can be examined to prove this. And um, you know you should support free and open source over Apple when you can anyway. So here's how it works. I've got a couple screenshots up here. Um, I've got some text with my friend Charlie so you can see kind of how it looks. It looks like a regular texting app. You can send images, you can send videos. Uh, it's got a, a, the full emoji keyboard. Don't worry, not taking your emojis away. Um, I should have put some emojis in that actually, um, but I wanted to do pizza rat and cigarette crab instead. Um, so you can see this is what the texting looks like. When you install Signal, it will then look at your contacts and see who is already using Signal. So you can get, it'll just update it. And anytime you add a new contact, it automatically updates the list. You can see anybody else who's using it. And if I wanted to make an encrypted call to Charlie, you can see up in the top right corner, um, 
is a little phone uh, icon. If I tap that, then I can have an encrypted call with him. Um, I'm gonna skip the next thing on here because I want to see if you guys have any questions and the other part of that was not that important. So this is my contact info again. Um, we have five minutes for questions. Does anyone have any? Yes. <clears throat> I realize I shouldn't be the one calling on people, sorry. <laughs> hey. um, you're um, saying Signal would be the best way to um, security send text messages, etc. cetera. Um, what would be your alternatives for less secure um, messaging apps such as um, WhatsApp and Telegram, et cetera? Um, don't use WhatsApp and don't use Telegram for anything. Especially not Telegram. I mean, people in Iran are getting arrested for using Telegram right now because Telegram was giving the content of encrypted, using a bad encryption scheme, encrypted messages to the Iranian government. Um, there's no reason that you would have to. It's a great, this is a, this is a totally great replacement for those. You can do group messages. It goes out over your data network, just like WhatsApp does. Like I don't use WhatsApp, so I don't know if there's some other feature that it has that people really like. But if you're just looking for something where you can have like messaging threads among multiple people that doesn't use your texts, that's what Signal is, basically. Um, WhatsApp does have, you can do secret text, secret chats in WhatsApp that actually uses the same encryption scheme as Signal. Um, but it's really hard, since it's not the default, you basically have to assume that the other person hasn't turned it on. And so it might be encrypted on your device, but it's not on theirs. So Signal, it's encrypted by default always. You can't use it. If it's, if it's not, it shows up in green because the other person hasn't installed it. Um, but yeah, so I would say it's, it's, to me, it's a viable replacement for both of those. I just misunderstood. I thought it was an SMS. Oh, no, 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 no. Sorry, I wasn't trying to put you on the spot either. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Hi, Alison. Thanks very much for that. A lot hey, of food sure, for totally. thought. Um, I have a few questions, but really quick ones, and I think I know the answer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, with Tor Browser, does it save your passwords, autofill forms? Nope. And, and it doesn't tell you what pages you've been in before. Obviously. Exactly, all that right. stuff is gone. Okay, yeah, yeah, thought so. And then just a DuckDuckGo, I've been kind of using that mm -hmm. lately. That's a fine one too. I find that DuckDuckGo search results are a little less sophisticated. Um, so that's why I like Disconnect better. But like DuckDuckGo is fine and it doesn't, it doesn't track you at all. You know, I mean, that's, right. that's the thing that it has in common with Disconnect. It's not storing any of your searches. Great, and just final question. So if you, if you search in Thor, um, Thor Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you, you wouldn't obviously get as many results as, as in Google. No, you get the same number. It's just that they're going to be ordered a little differently because Google is ordering them. Google's ordering them based on what it knows about you, and what it thinks you're more likely to click on. So it gives you a, a filter bubble essentially. Um, Disconnect and DuckDuckGo don't know anything about you, so you get. Um, it, obviously, there's no such thing as a neutral algorithm, but the closest thing to that because it's not personalized. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. I'll definitely give them a go. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Shona, I just saw what you t what you put on the internet. Can I can I respond to that? You said um, support free and open source, but not Android. These are tough choices to make. Android is not actually free and open source. It's. it's but you have more options for using free and open source. Sure. Android, I know. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, but I I wanted to mention that because I think a lot of people think that it is, and it's not. And that's part of the some of the issues with it is that if it was totally open source, we could get the software updates faster instead of having Google like keep this like lock on them. But it's true, you can get more open source apps, and actually that's why Tor Browser is even able to work on Android. So you can kind of balance it with some of the stuff from the Guardian project. But yeah, it's tough. I know. Sorry. <laughs> Just the messenger. Anybody else have questions? Just one last minute. Yes. Thanks again, Alison. That was brilliant. Oh, thank um, you. Two two trivial questions. Did sure. you say that Signal defeats Imsi Catchers? It should. It should. We, I don't want to say like for certain because Imsi Catchers yeah. are secret surveillance devices that the police refuse to answer questions about, and yeah. we're foying yeah. the shit out of them to yeah. see. But it seems like probably yes because of the way that because because of the way that they can collect data from a device. Okay, secondly, do I need to wear a dunce's cap for having used Ghostery and Adblock Plus rather no. than Privacy Badger and Ublock Origin? This is a safe space, okay? Yeah. A safer yeah. space. Yeah. 
and I would never shame anybody for their personal choices so unless they were you, like really like I don't care I'm gonna do this and I you should shame me um, ghostery here's what's wrong with ghostery um, ghostery is another browser extension that does the same kind of thing as privacy badger and uBlock origin ghostery though keeps information about its users sells it to hold on not even done sells it to advertisers mm. so that they can know about the kind of people who block ads I know mm. how fucking cynical yeah. of them right it's like Jesus, you had one job. <laughs> Terrible. I've stopped using it. <laughs> well, and, <Just> and also, <laughs> this brings up a good thing. Like, if you have something that you're using, or if you are curious about a tool, there's a lot of snake oil out there, and it's really hard to keep up. Just email me. I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll there's tell a you serious if it's good. number of Chrome extensions that keep track on you, aren't there? Yeah. 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 So you yeah. have to be careful. About what a lot you're of them are using. fake. Yeah. 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 So, Cheers. Thanks. Okay, cool. You can also come find me and talk to me after this. And please take my stickers. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, thanks, Millie and Alison. Uh, that was great. Um, how's it going? Posters outside. Uh, take a look at them and remember to vote. Uh, we will be back in here for the lightning talks at 10 to 4. Um, there's four of those to get through, so... Be back promptly. Um, but yeah, no, great. Take a look, ask questions, interrogate, and change all your apps. Extension.